Even among spiders, there are unrequited loves. But how and why have the feet of certain arachnids achieved such a high degree of sensitivity? The sensory capacity that spiders have come to develop in their extremities is extraordinary and surprising. In fact, certain species of spiders seem to rely exclusively on this super sense in order to survive. The trapdoor spider of the genus Stasimopus constructs a subterranean tube like so many other spiders, but it covers it perfectly with a trapdoor that hides its lair. Once finished, no one would suspect that someone lies in wait underground. But how does the spider know when prey passes by, or when it is a predator? Only by the tremor of its steps. No human seismograph would move even a millimeter for the micro-earthquake produced by the steps of a cricket. The trapdoor spiders probe the surroundings of their hidden lair by means of touch. They keep their front feet in contact with the silk that makes up the door of their hideout. And thanks to this sense of touch, the finest designed in all of nature, they await the appearance of prowlers who might be caught. The most remarkable thing is that the spider even knows how to assess when its prey is exactly at attack distance. A few millimeters further away, it doubts, but it does not decide. Only when the micro tremors tell it that the prey is in the correct direction and at the indicated point does the spider emerge. Then all it has to do is digest. For the propagation of vibrations, the opposite of a jungle would be a sheet of water flat and without any obstacles in the way. Sound travels through the still surface at long distances without changing wavelength or frequency. The amphibians that populate this medium mark their territories by singing constantly. They don't use smells or colors, only noise, and the louder the better. For the genes of these toads, this is their to be or not to be. The males of this species have only a few days to make sure that their family line doesn't end. They must convince a few females that approach the ponds that they are the best and most suitable mates. And only by croaking can the toad offer a valid argument in the dark. The density of males is many times greater than the number of females, so that disputes often occur over the best places. The strongest choose the site. The strength of their song is achieved thanks to a sac, which they can inflate and deflate with air from their lungs. Tensing the skin under their throat, they increase the volume of air that moves through their vocal cords. The larger they make their own personal resonance box, the more the sound is amplified. Nowadays, the discovery of resonance boxes is applied to modern speakers in our hi-fi systems in the same way it was used in primitive drums. According to their tension, the membranes that vibrate offer an entire scale of musical notes.
Vibrations move the air with more or less volume. Some are heard, others are not. And the same thing happens with the speed of each vibration. Those of high frequency, the fast ones over 20,000 oscillations per second, are no longer perceived by the human ear. We call them ultrasounds. The slow ones, of low frequency with fewer than 20 cycles per second, are infrasounds, and we can't hear them either. For that reason, the fact that a Western spadefoot sings does not imply that we can actually hear its whole repertoire. The toad sings for members of its species and in so low a frequency that only its own know how to locate it. This frog can be heard in a more normal acoustic band. Anyone can listen to it. But these frogs represent a new stage in acoustic emission. Unlike the several thousand species of frogs and toads around the world, this species, along with a very few others, boasts two sacs to sing with. That is, it sings in stereo. And that doesn't mean that its song is more beautiful. Its only purpose is to establish for its fellow frogs the exact location from which it is emitting the sound. Many other animals use resonance boxes to improve their communication. The skull of the howler monkey is a good example. Their roars resound in the forest, through the trees, to a distance of more than 10 miles. The very rare bellbird is also an extraordinary case among the megaphones of the tropical forests of Central America. This bird is getting scarcer every day, and today only in the most remote hidden away places can one have the good fortune to hear it. Seeing it is another matter altogether. At dozens of meters above the jungle floor, we were lucky enough to make one out. It was a young bird training for adulthood, from whom a few false and out-of-tune notes could be heard. It would have to wait another year before becoming a great tenor. Birds, and more concretely songbirds, would doubtless be the animals that best represent high fidelity in nature. Like loudspeakers that spread their music across land and air, they are almost always the background music in the countryside. Their warbles are almost always present, or their squawks. And along with the rest of the wild tenors, they form the great symphonic orchestra of the animal kingdom. That's all, folks.